One of the most infamous confidence tricksters of the 1800s, Jefferson Randolph, Soapy Smith, orchestrated various schemes across the American West for many years. From Texas to Colorado and all the way to Alaska, Smith formed crews of swindlers engaged in activities like shell games, rigged gambling, and other scams. Collaborating with figures such as Texas Jack Vermillion, Big Ed Burns, and a host of others. Born on November 2, 1860, in Noonan, Georgia, Smith hailed from an educated and affluent family. His great-grandfather owned a prestigious plantation in the region, and his father was a lawyer. However, akin to the fate of many Southern families, their prosperity declined after the Civil War. In 1876, the family relocated to Round Rock, Texas, and it was there that an 18-year-old Soapy witnessed the killing of outlaw Sam Bass two years later. Afterwards, Smith moved to Fort Worth, initiating his career as a bunco artist. In no time, he assembled a small, tight-knit group of rogues and thieves to carry out his scams, earning him the title of the King of the Frontier Con Men, as the gang traversed from town to town. Unsuspecting citizens engaged in their preferred games, which included the shell game, three-card monte, and other quick short cons. In the late 1870s, Smith devised his clever prize package soap cell swindle, a scheme that allowed him to profit from large crowds. This is where he earned the moniker Soapy. The con unfolded as Smith set up a Kaiser, a suitcase on a tripod stand, on a bustling street corner. Inside the suitcase were stacks of ordinary soap wrapped in simple paper. As curious onlookers paused to observe, he would proceed to wrap some soap bars with paper money, ranging from $1 to $100. After rewrapping them in plain paper, he would mix them with the others and sell the soap for $1 to $5 per bar. In the midst of the crowd, Soapy always had a shill ready to purchase a bar of soap, gleefully revealing a $100 bill upon opening it. This prompted the crowd to eagerly buy their own, only to discover it contained nothing more than a 5C cake of soap. For the next two decades, Smith continued this swindle with remarkable success. By 1879, Soapy and his gang had relocated to Denver, Colorado, where he expanded his operations beyond short cons to include larger scams such as fake stock exchanges and lottery offices. However, they continued their smaller games, taking advantage of Denver's lenient attitude towards gambling, providing an ideal backdrop for their deceptive activities. With money pouring in, Soapy began organizing many of the men operating in Denver, establishing himself as the boss of the city's underworld crime empire. To sustain his various scams, Smith offered kickbacks to saloon owners, had city officials on his payroll, and generally avoided targeting local residents, focusing instead on transient travelers. Building loyalty within his gang, he quickly assisted members in need and ensured their swift release if they were ever jailed. Maintaining a philanthropist image, he made charitable contributions to churches and the city's poor, even allowing ministers to conduct Sunday services in his saloons, further ingratiating himself with the locals. A significant portion of Soapy's Denver activities unfolded in his popular Tivoli Saloon and Gambling Hall. Above the entrance hung a sign that declared, Caveat Emptor, translating to, Let the Buyer Beware, in Latin. However, for those entering seeking a much-needed drink or hoping to try their luck at the gaming tables, Latin was not within their comprehension. Intriguingly, the renowned Bat Masterson served as a dealer at the Tivoli for a period. During this period, Soapy was joined by his younger brother Bascomb, who operated a cigar store, serving as a front for rigged card games and other scams. The gang was also in running a counterfeit stock exchange, lottery shops, and fraudulent diamond auctions. For several years, Smith established roots, making Denver his home. Despite Denver newspapers reporting that he held complete sway over the criminal and gambling underworld in the city and rightly accusing him of colluding with city politicians, including the police chief, his operations continued to thrive. While his main operations were in Denver, Soapy expanded his reach. In 1885, he collaborated with another con artist in Leadville, Colorado forming a partnership with a con artist known only as Old Man Taylor. The duo successfully ran a shell game on many unsuspecting miners. In 1891, Soapy persuaded his otherwise law-abiding brother-in-law from Texas to join his criminal empire in Denver. William Cap Light, who had served as a deputy marshal in Belton, Texas, changed his allegiance upon joining Smith. 
Light was alongside Soapy when the gang attacked the Glasson Detective Agency. Allegedly, the agency had tried to coerce a confession from a young girl, and upon learning of it, Smith and his men stormed their offices with pistols in hand. This further enhanced Soapy's reputation as a hero among many locals. However, by 1892, the Genteel Society in Denver had started to demand reforms against gambling and saloons. Smith was also losing his throne as the boss of Denver, partly due to rival gangs like the Blonger Brothers, but also because of his volatile temper and issues with alcohol. His rising notoriety made it increasingly challenging for his paid politicians to continue ignoring his activities, as they had done for many years. With many of his operations facing restrictions and seeing an opportunity in the thriving mining camp of Creed, Colorado, Soapy and his gang relocated their empire. He swiftly opened the Orleans Club, a gambling hall and saloon that operated much like his Tivoli Club in Denver, but without the constraints imposed in the larger city. At his new establishment, Soapy briefly exhibited a petrified man, charging a fee of 10 cent for admission. The petrified man, fondly known as McGinty, was yet another deception, as it was simply cement covering skeletal remains. Nevertheless, this oddity attracted patrons to the saloon and generated a modest profit. The ultimate goal was to lure these unsuspecting customers into crooked card games. Simultaneously, he persuaded his brother-in-law, William Cap Light, to take on the role of deputy marshal in the camp. Leveraging his influence, Soapy declared himself the camp boss. In this capacity, he shielded his friends and associates while expelling violent troublemakers. Once again, he won favor with the camp by using his funds to construct churches and assist the impoverished. However, Creed's era as a boomtown was short-lived, prompting Smith to return to Denver. Return to Denver. The city's gambling regulations had once again eased, and Soapy resumed his activities at the Tivoli, which had remained open throughout his absence. While organized crime persisted in Denver, a new state governor had assumed office. Davis H. Bloody Bridles. Waite, elected on a platform of social reform, took the reins in January 1893 and promptly launched an investigation into corruption in Colorado. By March of the following year, he was prepared to confront Denver's politically tainted machinery. He initiated the process by dismissing three members of the fire and police board whom he deemed primary contributors to corruption in City Hall. Waite went on to insist that the city rectify its issues promptly, or he would take matters into his own hands. After ousting the corrupt individuals with his own nominees, the newly appointed commissioners faced resistance from the incumbents who refused to vacate their positions upon the arrival of the replacements. Interestingly, while the state charter empowered the governor to make appointments, it did not confer the authority to compel a municipal government to accept those appointments. Concerned about losing their positions, other corrupt city officials rallied behind their superiors and jointly resisted relinquishing their authority. The city escalated the dispute to the district court, which issued a temporary injunction preventing the governor from intervening in the city's appointments. Nevertheless, Governor Waite and his legal team maintained that the state's chief executive was not subject to the district court's review. Persisting in his demand for the commissioners to step down, Waite went so far as to threaten the deployment of the state militia to enforce their removal if necessary. Subsequently, Denver's mayor initiated the enlistment of a special police force to safeguard City Hall in anticipation of any militia dispatched by the governor. The political force, funded and supported by organized crime, including figures like Soapy Smith and Lou Blonger, quickly amassed around 200 dubious deputies. Notably, the leadership of this force was entrusted to none other than Soapy Smith, now bestowed with the title Colonel Smith. Amid armed sentinels securing City Hall, Governor Waite issued orders for the Colorado State Militia to forcibly oust the commissioners. By mid-March, martial law was declared by the governor, transforming Denver into an armed encampment. Waite's military contingent, comprising approximately 200 men, advanced downtown, accompanied by two Gatling guns and two 12-pound cannons. Pointing their formidable weapons directly at City Hall, they confronted the special police force, armed with rifles and shotguns. Under the leadership of Colonel Smith, the police force challenged the militia to open fire, 
threatening to employ dynamite in retaliation. The two factions stood in a tense standoff, observed by thousands of onlookers. Simultaneously, the Chamber of Commerce and various citizens' committees labored intensively to broker a compromise that would avert hostilities. Eventually, an agreement was reached to defer the matter to the state Supreme Court. Waite withdrew his military forces, awaiting the court's decision, while the city of Denver collectively breathed a sigh of relief. On April 16, 1894, the Supreme Court delivered a decisive victory for Governor Davis Waite, leading to the replacement of the Board of Commissioners the following day. The political machine was dismantled, paving the way for the swift development of new policies aimed at cleaning up the town. Denver soon witnessed the prohibition of gambling, and the reinvigorated authorities cracked down rigorously on other illicit activities, including prostitution, bootlegging, and various bunco schemes. A top priority for them was expelling Soapy Smith from the city. Despite's group of Skagway citizens had finally had enough of Soapy, leading to the formation of a vigilante group known as the Committee of 101, they threatened to expel Smith and his gang from town. In response, Soapy retaliated by creating his own group, claiming it had over 300 members. Hoping to coerce the vigilantes into submission, his strategy proved successful. When the Spanish-American War commenced in 1898, Smith organized a voluntary militia approved by the U.S. War Department by the U.S. War Department. Named the Skagway Military Company, Soapy assumed the role of captain, solidifying his grip on the town. Meanwhile, the vigilante group grew increasingly displeased. When Soapy's gang unlawfully took $2,600 in gold from a Klondike miner during an illicit three-card Monte game, the vigilantes reappeared, demanding the return of the gold. Soapy adamantly refused, asserting that the miner had lost the gold fairly in a sporting game, in a sporting game. On July 8, 1898, the vigilantes convened a meeting in Skagway, Alaska, and upon learning of it, Soapy decided to attend, carrying a Winchester rifle over his shoulder.